Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. With that, we'll call this meeting of the City Council of Nicolau to order. I welcome our guest, the administration, the rest of council. And if you will, Ms. Byrne. Mayor Cook. Yes. Councilman Grimm. I'm here. Councilman Bond. Here. Councilman Shammy. Here. Councilwoman Wright. Here. Councilman Lindsay. Here. Vice Mayor Eggleston. Here. Seven members mm -hmm. present. And with that, we'll have the invocation by Chief Trustee. Father, Lord, we thank you for this day and all thy many blessings and the beautiful weather that you've blessed us with, Father. Please be in this meeting tonight, Lord. Let thy perfect will be done and only your will. Please bless our troops, their families, and our first responders. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. And to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. With that, I need action on the minutes of 5-20-24, regular session. So moved. First. Second. Second. Whatever. Uh, I just heard Lindsay first and yeah. Shami second. All right. Any discussion? <clears throat> if not? Councilman Wright? Yes. Councilman Lindsay? Yes. Vice Mayor Eggleston? Yes. Mayor Cook? Yes. Councilman Grimm? Yes. Councilman Bond? Yes. Councilman Shami? Yes. And it's accepted 7 0. And I need a motion for the minutes of the special meeting on 5 28 so 24. Second. Councilman Wright? Yes. Councilman Lindsay? Yes. Vice Mayor Eggleston? Yes. Mayor uh, Cook? Yes. Councilman Grimm? Yes. Councilman Vaughn? Yes. Councilman Shammy? Yes. Mm -hmm. It's accepted 7 0. And with that, I need a motion and a second for the meeting minutes of 603 so 24. Second. Councilman Wright? Yes. Councilman Lindsay? Yes. Vice Mayor Eggleston? Yes. Mayor Cook? Yes. Councilman Grimm? Yes. Councilman Bond? Yes. Councilman Shammy? <coughs> Minutes accepted 7 0. And with it, <coughs> go ahead. I'd like to make a motion to amend the agenda to add Amy Henry on the communications. All right. From OSU Extension Office. Any discussion? I didn't hear a second. Second. <clears throat> Councilman Lindsay? Yes. Vice Mayor Eggleston? Yes. Mayor Cook? Yes. Councilman Grimm? Yes. Councilman Bond? Yes. Councilman Shammy? Yes. Councilwoman Wright? Yes. And, I'm in a second. and with that, yeah. I will turn the meeting over to those two ladies and which one wants to go first? You mean the one lady? <laughs> I forgot to ask you about it today. Now this this pertains to the chicken situation, so you know we're going to be specific and stay within those guidelines. Sure. Well, hello. I'm Amy Henry. Um, I teach agriculture at Global Impact STEM Academy. I'm um, a 4-H uh, volunteer through Ohio State Extension and uh, I've raised chickens for a really long time. Uh, probably thousands of chickens. We have um, egg laying chickens, meat chickens, um, ducks, turkeys, dairy cattle, meat goats, and dairy goats on our farm. So we have a lot of different species. Um, but uh, Peggy had asked me today to speak about chickens and how to raise them, some do's and don'ts, and some general guidelines. I'm assuming is that uh, all of you are here to learn about chicken raising, chicken rearing? I'm all for education. Okay, awesome. Well, I didn't want to start if you with stuff that you all already know. Um, but there's three basic things that I would break this into. One is um, knowing what kind of chickens you want to, to purchase and for what goals. Um, and so selecting your birds. Number two is how to, how to um, 
feed them and nutritional needs, and then three is how to care for them. So I thought those were the three things that I would talk about this evening. So the very first thing that I want to talk about um, is selecting your birds. So there are really four different categories of birds that you can select. One is um, a meat bird. And so if you're interested in raising um, chickens for meat production, uh, that's really simple and really easy. And I can, can speak to that in about two minutes. Um, if your goal is to raise egg laying chickens, um, that's a little bit more involved. And I can, can speak to that here in just a second as well. The third one is for exhibition chickens. Those are birds that are gonna go to different shows and fairs and are only bred for the purpose of shows. Uh, they're not bred because they're extremely hardy or that they have a lot of great meat or that they lay a lot of eggs. They're really just raised as exhibition birds. If you've ever watched like the, um, the dog show on Thanksgiving where a lot of the you know show dogs, it's sort of the same principle. And then the fourth one is pet birds. And so uh, I have no experience raising pet um, anything for livestock. So uh, if that's your goal, um, you might have to ask someone else because I'm not familiar with how to raise them just as pets. So everything on our farm has a purpose. They either lay eggs or they're raised for meat and that's it. And so um, the very first thing you need to ask yourself if you're thinking about raising um, livestock is what are your goals? Are you wanting to put meat in your freezer or are you wanting to uh, put eggs in your refrigerator? Um, there are some breeds that are considered dual purpose. I would steer you away from thinking that you're gonna get the best of both worlds if you were to get a breed that's considered a dual purpose breed. Um, mostly that means they're gonna lay some eggs and be a heavier muscled bird that when they um, go to butcher, they might give you a little bit more for the freezer. But in general, you're gonna kinda get a mid bird at both of those tasks. So the very first thing is selecting your birds. And I always say, start with the end in mind. So a lot of, uh, of what I do is work with um, schools, particularly urban school districts who wanna, um, wanna raise chickens. And I always ask them, what are your goals? So that's the very first thing that I would encourage you to do is decide, are you wanting to raise chickens for meat or are you wanting to raise chickens for eggs? You can do both, but those are gonna be two separate projects. They're probably not going to be the same birds. For both. <clears throat> there are some dual purpose, as I said, but they're probably not going to give you the best outcome for either of those situations. So um, when you're selecting your birds, I would highly encourage you to get them from a certified hatchery. Ohio has several certified hatcheries. Um, hatcheries have to uh, go through a lot of, of inspection. Um, I'm a certified polar room inspector for, for Ohio Department of Agriculture. I've never had a backyard chicken producer ask me, can you come test my birds for polar room? Not that everybody's backyard chickens have polar room, but um, generally a backyard producer is not concerned about some of those things that a huge hatchery would be concerned about. So my number one recommendation is to start with good stock. So if your goal is to raise egg laying chickens, then select breeds that are gonna give you really great quality eggs every single day from a certified hatchery. Um, if your goal is to get um, meat birds, there's a lot less to choose from um, in terms of, of breeds. There's really only one that I would recommend, and that is the Cornish Rock Cross. Over 90% of the meat birds raised in, um, in the United States are Cornish Rock Crosses. If you take your weight right now, whatever it is, times it by seven, right? In seven weeks, what if I told you that's how much you would weigh? That's the rate of gain for a Cornish Rock Cross. They are genetically superior to all other breeds they will start the size of a golf ball and they will end the size of a basketball in seven weeks. So if you are new to poultry uh, production and you don't really know if you wanna be um, an egg laying family or a meat family, I would strongly encourage you start with meat birds because they are super simple to raise, they are quick, and they will give you a lot of output pretty quickly. Um, in seven weeks, those guys are gonna go to butcher. 
regardless, uh, just make sure that you get them from a certified hatchery. So a lot of times when people are starting their, their chicken um, endeavors, they have a friend or an aunt or a neighbor that has some chickens that they wanna get rid of. Not that those birds aren't healthy, not that those birds aren't friendly, but um, you don't know where they've been or maybe you think you do, but you don't know how they've been cared for. You should always start with really good stock. So always get them from a certified hatchery. I don't wanna make a recommendation for hatcheries, but if you just Google it, there are several in the state of Ohio that, um, that are really great. If you get birds from across state lines, you have to also have vet papers to cross state lines. So that's why I would just recommend if you get them from Ohio, then you don't have to worry about that. Um, hatcheries will send them to you. They'll ship them to you for an additional charge. You can do that. We've done that before. We've had some success with that. Uh, but also, you can go pick them up. So if you're doing meat birds, most hatcheries are gonna hatch thousands, maybe tens of thousands of those a month. Um, and so you just call them and say, when's your next hatch date? They might say, oh, we've got 4,000 available next Tuesday. So you can go you know, pick them up next Tuesday or they'll ship them to you the following day. Um, if you are doing egg laying chickens and you have a whole list, they'll give you a whole catalog and you can just sift through all the different breeds. Again, as you're researching those breeds, I highly encourage you to pick ones that are hardy in the winter and hardy in the summer. Ohio is one of the most difficult temperate zones to raise egg laying chickens if you're doing it backyard. Um, now we're, what, third in the country in egg production, I think, um, or third or fourth, we're always in the top five um, for egg laying um, chickens. But 99% of those are in huge commercial hen houses that are temperature controlled, climate controlled, humidity controlled. Um, and so if you are doing this in your backyard, um, you wanna make sure that you select birds that are gonna be hardy in the summer and hardy in the winter. So that's gonna take a huge long list and a big catalog and narrow it down to a handful of breeds. Um, so that's what I would suggest. Uh, first starting with a, a certified hatchery, talking to them. If you start with a hatchery in the state of Ohio, they're familiar with our weather. So then they can also make recommendations to you about that. Um, but any questions about selecting birds? You mentioned um, by hatchery standards, you, know, you do get them in the mail. Mm -hmm. You know, they get the little chicks in the mail, you know. But I saw a video where a lot of them died going through the mail, too. Yeah. Um, we've done it both ways on our farm. I've not had any mm -hmm. arrive dead, um, but sometimes you'll have, um, you know, up to 3 5% that do die, you know, within a day or two, which is why I like to go get them. Um, directly. Uh, most of them will put a vitamin pack in for them um, so that way if they're shipping and they again you can plan around the weather I wouldn't ship them in you know the middle of an ice storm and I wouldn't ship them this week if, if you're getting birds this week I'd go pick them up <laughs> I wouldn't ship them through the mail but they'll ship them to your um, to your post office the post office will call you and they'll say hey your birds are here you can come get them um, which is always kind of fun if you have kids that's a lot of fun. I don't inspect facilities, um, just testing for pullerum. Um, uh, pullerum is a disease um, that they can get that'll, that is contagious. Um, and so just through a simple blood test, uh, we can just test in about 60 seconds to know if that flock is clean. A lot of, in a lot of our meetings, we're talking about bird food. Yes. You know, can you, you know, how prevalent is that? Yeah. Well, I can talk about that. Um, I can skip to that if you want. Um, so when it comes to housing your birds, whether you're getting meat birds or egg laying chickens, if you're getting meat birds, meat birds um, don't fly. They can fly for about two or three days. But remember when I said they get to the size of a golf ball or from a golf ball to a basketball, uh, they're gonna be really heavy. They're gonna be seven pounds um, and they their little wings are not made to fly. So your meat birds, um, they can have a much smaller space. They don't need roosts. They don't need um, the special <coughs> coops. Uh, you know, a lot of the coops that you can buy at TSC or somewhere like that have the exterior, you know, where you can lift the lid and get the eggs. They don't need all that. So all they need is just some square footage to, to, to be, just to grow. Um, and so 
that's a little bit easier to manage. Your, your egg laying chickens, on the other hand, um, are gonna need a coop. And so they're gonna want, depending on the breed, they're gonna want something to roost on because they can fly. They're a lot lighter weight. Um, so many of them, many of those breeds can fly and prefer to roost up on something. With that, um, a lot of people like to let those egg layers free range in their yard. So avian influenza, um, it's highly pathogenic avian influenza, HPATH, um, is a zoonic disease. So it's contagious to humans. So if you have um, pre-existing conditions, it can get you sick. It can pass quickly from bird to bird. Um, so it is, they are tracing it through USDA. Um, generally, they, it starts kind of in the south and moves its way up as migratory birds move north. Um, and so what they'll do if they detect it, uh, in the past, I don't know what the protocol is right now, but in the past, if there's a, a farm that tests positive for it, um, they'll draw a circle around that farm and um, sometimes it's as small as 30 miles um, and say any birds within that vicinity, we're gonna test them. If they test positive, they're gonna eradicate that flock. Wild birds is your biggest concern. If you are a backyard poultry producer, backyard uh, wild birds is your biggest concern. So back to housing those birds, um, I highly recommend a fully enclosed um, facility where your egg laying chickens that want to roost are not roosting in your trees. They are roosting in a coop that you have created, that you've built, um, because if they come in contact with those wild birds, that's how they're getting it. So it's passed through their droppings. Um, and so if, they, if you allow them to interact with wild birds, that's how your flock can get it. So you're saying just keep them top? Yes. Top one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Yep. Um, well, so in terms of housing these birds, how much space should you have? Um, your meat birds, they don't want to move around a lot. They're kind of just fat and lazy. <laughs> if you're getting um, Cornish rock crosses, just imagine um, how you feel after a big Thanksgiving meal, and that's kind of how they feel all the time. So um, they are not going to try to fly. However, um, hawks and your neighbor's cat, raccoons, are they are just uh, you know sitting sitting there waiting to, to munch on them. So you want to still have a top uh, for them, whether they're meat birds or whether they're um, egg laying birds. So that's one of the biggest mistakes that I've seen people make is if they're raising uh, meat birds, they think, well, they can't fly, so I don't need to buy a coop. That is true. You don't need to buy a coop for an egg laying chicken. You can just have a pin, and I'll get to that in a second, but it still needs to have a top on it because uh, predators will get in. And you might say, well, we don't really have raccoons in our area, or the neighbor's dog is really nice. That's because you don't have chickens yet. Once you get chickens, those hawks will come, those raccoons will come, the neighbor's dog will lick his lips just waiting on you to turn your back uh, to get to that chicken because they taste good. So we like them and they like them. Um, so when it comes to um, housing them, if you have egg laying chickens, like I said, egg laying chickens require a lot more attention. They require a lot more space. They require uh, a lot more um, dietary um, consideration. So I'll talk about them first. Um, so your egg laying chickens are generally gonna need about 10 square feet per bird. They're going to need inside space where they can roost and where they can have a nest, where they can lay their eggs, and they're gonna need outside space. Um, when it comes to um, the, the coop itself inside, they generally say three to four feet per bird um, inside and eight to 10 feet outside where they can <laughs> roam and walk around. The entire thing should be fully enclosed. Number one, to keep your chickens in, and number two, to keep those predators out and to also keep out wild birds. Which brings me to the point, I brought this because um, I, I just think it's so incredibly critical. When you go to any hardware store, you go to online to buy poultry supplies, it's poultry netting, I should get poultry netting, or it's poultry fence, I should get poultry fence. All of those are designed to keep birds in. They are not designed to keep predators out. So this is the only stuff that I have ever found that keeps predators out. Um, and so I just brought it so if anyone's interested, you can see the size and the thickness of it. Uh, but your entire 
facility, whatever it is, whatever you uh, create, should have this, this gauge wire, this small of holes. And you might think, well, the dog kennel has close that. It, I'm telling you, a mink, a muskrat, a, a raccoon will get through anything um, that's not this, this gauge and this small of holes. Um, also, snakes will steal your eggs. So. Um, if you're raising egg laying chickens. So I brought that um, as, as an example. Uh, also a big mistake that I see people make is they get um, uh, an enclosure and they'll set it on the ground and forget that a lot of predators dig and so they can dig under. And so um, if you wanna set it on uh, some kind of, of hard surface like um, cinder blocks uh, if you want to set it on concrete, that's best because a lot of predators will dig. Um, if you have meat birds, they don't need a roost bar. They don't need uh, nesting boxes. Um, they, they just kind of want to lay and eat and drink <laughs> and live their best life for those seven weeks. So um, you don't need as much, uh, as much space. You don't need to worry about the interior space, exterior space, because they're only going to be around for seven weeks. Three of that they're going to be in a brooder anyway so uh, they really don't have a lot of time that they need outside um, i did bring a couple of examples of things that you're going to want to make sure that you have um, poultry feeders are are called poultry feeders because they have the the things on the top chickens scratch to eat that's a natural behavior even if they are on a complete feed they are still going to want to scratch when they scratch, anything that they picked up in your grass then ends up in their food, which they're then ingesting. So um, if you discourage that, that's good, at least for their feed that you're feeding them. So this type of feeder is good. A lot of people will hang it from the ceiling um, or create some kind of uh, you know, bar to hang it on so that they can't perch on it. If you have egg-laying chickens, they want to perch on just about everything. So that's something to keep in mind. That's why a lot of people hang it from a chain, because then they can't perch on it. Um, if you have uh, meat birds, you don't have to worry, unless you're raising them in the wintertime, about how to keep them um, warm and how to keep the water from freezing. One of the biggest questions that I get is about November, I'll have people call and say, I didn't think about the water situation. How do I keep it from freezing? Uh, so I brought an example of one. This is straight out of our coop. Um, you have to have electric. So that's something to consider, um, getting electric to your coop. So this is one example. Um, a lot of people find these to be a pain because to fill them you have to turn them upside down. I don't know who designed that, but every poultry um, heated water thing is like that. And it, uh, So uh, we have just gotten uh, a heated dog bowl and you put it in there it's a lot easier to fill you don't have to worry about the you know flipping it uh, but again I would keep these up high put them on a couple of cinder blocks otherwise the chickens will get in it and then it gets gross um, if you come across waters like this that have the little um, the little buckets where they like put their beak in uh, these are for exhibition birds so this is for if a bird is in a cage um, at a fair or at a show. So I've gone to some people's uh, farms before and they are trying to use these as their sole water source. Um, it's just not gonna be as convenient for you or the bird. Um, so these are generally just used at exhibition only. Um, the way that chickens cool off is their wattles, which are those like things that hang down, um, and their combs, they'll dip that in the water to cool off. And so oftentimes, they, this doesn't give them enough depth to dip their whole bottle in and get cooled off. So again, back to if you're raising birds in Ohio, this is great for an exhibition bird for a day or two in a cage at a fair, but I wouldn't recommend this as their sole water source at home. Um, what else? Oh, these feeders are also exhibition feeders. So a lot of uh, times I'll go to people's homes and they have these, which seem great, you get these at, at every farm supply store, uh, but again, um, chickens like to scratch, and so they'll end up roosting on these, because these attach to the, the fence, and they'll end up roosting on these and pooping in it, and then you have a whole another mess. So I would recommend a feeder like this. Um, in terms of feed, uh, there are lots of options out there. 
one of the biggest recommendations I make is go to a feed store, not a general farm store. Um, nobody here works at <coughs> Royal King, right? Okay, nothing is Royal King, they have great stuff, but I would not buy your, your, your chicken feed that you're planning on feeding for the rest of their lives uh, there. I would make uh, time to build a relationship with a feed mill or a feed store and get good high quality feed. Um, chickens like to, to have all kinds of snacks and a lot of times people will go to a, a farm store and get all kinds of fun snacks. The little meal worms and the little, looks like little granola bars. They look yummy enough for me to want to eat. Uh, those are snacks. They aren't a sole ration. And so if you go to a feed store and talk to a, a feed dealer, they can um, give you your best uh, advice. Generally, meat birds should be on an 18% protein. Um, your egg layers should be on somewhere around a 12% protein. If they aren't laying eggs yet, oh, that's a big one. A lot of people forget that when you buy um, your egg layers, they should all be female, right? Um, so the hatchery is going to say, do you want a straight run? Because that's cheaper. If your goal is to raise egg layers, you don't want a straight run because guess who doesn't lay eggs? Boys. <laughs> you don't want boys, so you want all girls. Uh, and so uh, make sure you, you tell them that. Um, but they won't lay eggs for about six months. So you want to make sure that uh, during that six month period, they are not on egg layer feed. Egg layer feed has a lot of oyster shells, a lot of extra calcium, which can be toxic to birds that aren't laying yet. So once they start laying their first, um, their first eggs, then you can switch them over to an egg layer feed. Your meat birds, uh, they have what's called a starter grower. You feed them the same thing all the time from start to finish. Regardless, um, I just brought an example. If it looks like this, right, these are crumbles. This is a complete feed. So uh, a feed mill, a, a feed company has formulated all the nutrition that those birds need and put it into one, one sole ration. That's the goal, um, unless you want to spend a lot of time watching your birds and knowing, okay, I think they ate about this much of the, of the pumpkin seeds and they ate about this much of the watermelon and, they, and trying to, to do that yourself. Mm. I would highly recommend just getting a complete feed from a, a food dealer. Uh, building that relationship with them because they can give you advice if you have any issues with one of them being overweight or not having good feathers and that sort of thing. Um, so anyways, that's what I recommend. Um, okay, last thing that I wanted to talk about was uh, if you are raising meat birds, you're going to get them in a box about the size of a shoe box, depending on how many you get, um, and they're going to be the size of a basketball in less than two months oh my, how do you get those to the butcher? And so uh, I always recommend, number one, schedule your butcher date before you ever buy your chickens. Uh, I know it sounds counterintuitive, counting your chickens before they hatch, but <laughs> <laughs> you really need to schedule a butcher date before um, you ever buy your birds. The reason being um, um, butchering facilities are backed up, and they have been since COVID. And so they might say, our earliest butcher date is not until September 1st. Well, these birds are going to be ready in seven weeks. So you need to count backwards seven weeks and not get them until then. Um, if a meat bird, remember we talked about, they're genetically bred to just grow exponentially. If they go past their prime, you're going to get a lot of fat. Um, you'll have some that, that have some heart issues because they are not bred to, to be long, long livers. So um, you want to make sure that you get them butchered in a timely manner. So schedule that butcher date and then schedule when you're going to pick up your birds. Most hatcheries will um, they'll hatch them several times a week um, and they have thousands and thousands of them. So, um, so make sure you get that scheduled first. Then the next thing you want to do is order a chicken crate um, because a lot of people are like, well, how much space could 10 birds take up taking them to butcher? They're not going to fit in your dog kennel, which a lot of people think, I can just keep shopping them in there. And then when you get to the butcher, some of them are dead, right? So this is a chicken crate. Um, I just brought it for visual. Um, we bought ours on Facebook Marketplace used. A lot of people have them. You can make them yourself if you're handy. Um, but you want something to get them to the butcher um, safely. Um, that they aren't going to flap around. One thing to keep in mind is their wings are pretty delicate. 
know, remember if we're talking meat birds, these are fat birds with really delicate wings. And so if you have um, like a dull kennel where they might jump up uh, because they have room above their head, um, that wing can get broken. And you just spent seven weeks raising this bird and now you can't have that chicken wing, right? And so the whole point is you want to be able to eat it. And so that chicken wing is going to be um, discarded at the, at the butcher. So you want to make sure that you have a great egg carcass. You don't want any, <coughs> any flaws. So I highly recommend getting a crate as soon as you order your birds. That way you have a way to get them to, um, to the facility. We put 10 in here. So um, we generally take like 60 or 70 to the butcher at a time. So we have seven or eight of these. Does that help? Yeah. Could you clarify on the flying? You know, chickens don't really fly like right, right. most people think. And you said fly a couple times. So. Uh, well, when I say about meat birds, yeah. Okay. When I say fly, like they still flap their wings and want to fly, but they can't because they're just too fat. <laughs> um, but they're going to flap their wings a lot. Also, that's how they cool down um, is to get uh, their their wings out. So meat birds, um, they'll have a few days when they start to get their first wing feathers where they can kind of get off the ground about a foot. And then after that, they just can't. Um, but your egg laying chickens, they will be able to fly um, a little bit, depending on the breed. So if they, especially like your leghorns, um, if you're looking at your, your egg layer catalog, <coughs> there's lots of breeds. If you're looking at it um, and you want white eggs like you would buy at the store, then you're gonna end up getting white leghorns. That's the number one most popular egg laying breed in America is the white leghorn. They fly, so they're very flighty, um, and so that those are birds that are going to want perches and lots of, of roosting bars. Um, so if you take those to butcher, you're definitely going to want a crate like this because they'll try to fly up and they could injure themselves in transport. Does that help? I, don't, I always consider it more of a hop than yeah, a fly. Yeah, probably it, a hop. It's <laughs> not really a fly. It's a hop. <laughs> Anyone else have a question for the young lady? Yeah. Um, yes. A lot of people are concerned about the chicken spreading salmonella because it's a CPC that was that study. And I know only 103 people have gotten it in the entire country that have back their chickens. But what is an easy way to prevent that? Wash your hands. Soap and water. Wash your hands. Yep. <laughs> yep. E. coli also. E. coli also exists in, in chickens, and just wash your hands. Soap and water. I'm not a doctor. Wash your hands as well. Yeah. I saw a couple of things that plug in feeders or maybe heat lamps. If you were like 40 feet back in your yard, how would you get electricity to that? It's a good question. Um, I, I've seen lots of different things that people have done. Uh, we, we ran electric um, underground, but I've seen people do extension cords. Do you think that's safe? They don't want to go in records. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, so in terms of heat lamps, um, I would not recommend putting a heat lamp in a coop, ever. Um, just do your homework and get breeds that are hardy for the winter. Um, now in terms of heating their water buckets, um, that's, that's up to you to decide. Um, a lot of people use extension cords. Okay. Uh, I, um, what do you do with the Oh, that's a great question. Um, so uh, I teach in Springfield um, City School District. I teach at Global Impact STEM Academy. So we checked with um, our local um, authorities and we're allowed to throw um, our, our shavings into the trash. Um, so I would check with your, your trash provider, but... Um, so in your coop, you're going to want some kind of bedding. So some people will use sand, which um, has its pros and cons. So sand is easy to wash. It's easy to care for. It keeps them cool in the summer. Um, a lot of people will use shavings. So you, uh, I would recommend pine shavings. You should never use cedar shavings. Cedar shavings can be toxic. Um, so you always want to use pine shavings if you're using shavings. Um, but the more often you change your, your chicken's bedding, the cleaner the coop is going to be. Um, they, uh, ventilation is huge. 
Um, and so making sure that there's plenty of ventilation and that, um, I don't know how, how much time. So a chicken's digestive tract, urinary tract, and reproductive tract all come together at the cloaca. And so everything comes out together. Um, so their urine, their, their poop, and their eggs all come out of the vent at the, so and so. Um, well, so you would put your so you would put your shavings in the coop part only. Um, you wouldn't put it in the outdoor run. So the coop part is under roof, and you would only put the bedding there. Um, and so that's gonna when they go to the bathroom, um, that's gonna soak that in, right? Um, and then the more often you change it, the cleaner it is inside of that coop. Uh, it will get dusty if you don't clean it uh, frequently, so I would recommend cleaning it um, pretty frequently. But at least in Springfield, we could put ours in the trash. Is it against the law just to dump the manure somewhere? I mean, it would have to be on your own land. And then <clears throat> there's um, there are 10 GPPs. Um, GPP stands for Good Production Practice. And so one of them is environmental stewardship. So uh, when it comes to manure application on farm fields, there's certain times that you can spread it. The, there has to be a certain temperature. It can't be within a certain number of hours of a rain event. Um, and so, so some of those things would apply to, to large scale production. Uh, if it's just you in your backyard, I mean, I guess you could have a, a compost pile. Yeah, um, it's high in ammonia. So you want to be careful to not uh, put too much on plants. So I have a lung, uh, lung disease. Okay. So you were saying something about that and I didn't catch all of it, so. Yeah, so um, they're, um, they're. I'm not gonna do any, I'm just saying for anybody around me. Okay, um, so their droppings when they go to the bathroom are all together, right? So. Um, that that'll get absorbed into those shavings and then when they clean those shavings out that eliminates that uh, but if you don't clean it out over the course of problem if a neighbor does it or something like that if a neighbor if a neighbor has chickens it, you shouldn't as yeah, long as they're keeping them clean yeah uh, but ventilation is really important in the coop um, so making sure that the chickens are healthy Yeah. Just um, out of curiosity, with a lot of stuff that you've shown, which is really nice to see some of this stuff in all the things they use, um, if you were going to raise, say, three or four, just for conversation, say, chickens, I mean, to, 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 uh, for someone who's just starting out a car, startup cost, and I know that's a loaded question because you don't know how big you're going to build it and things of that nature. I mean, what's the cost of, like, you know, you're, are you going to be deeper in the hole as far as what you spent to start up versus going to buy three chickens? Um, I mean, what's the start, so what's the start of cost to, sure. to get a, a set of Sure. Out? So the state minimum is six. So you have to buy six at a time because they're a flock bird. Okay. Um, so everything you're doing would be um, a minimum of six. So um, with if, <laughs> if you're doing egg laying chickens, because that requires a bigger coop and a lot more you're having them all year round. Um, the expense of that, you're not going to make money selling eggs. I can tell you that. <laughs> um, if you're doing meat birds, um, ours at home are organic, so we have a little bit of a different niche market. Um, and we've sold to restaurants, which is a, a different market than if you're just trying to put them in your freezer. Um, but what did we add up? I think it was somewhere around $12 a bird. Uh, is what we had in them that was with organic feed, which is about three times the cost of other feed. Um, and then the most expensive part of raising your bird is going to be butchering it. So, um, did What's that cost? Just out of curiosity. Um, well, if you only have a couple, it's going to cost you a lot more per bird than it would for a run. So, um, we used to go to uh, Bradford, which is where I think just about every poultry producer ever met has taken their birds 
they recently just became commercial only. So um, I forget the minimum. I want to say it's 100 um, at a time that you have to take. Um, so you have to, to find a butcher uh, that will take only six. Um, and so generally it's a flat fee plus per pound. So you might have four or five dollars wrapped up in butchering that animal at a, at a butchering facility. And then what they do with the carcass afterwards is also going to cost you money. So if you want it as a whole bird, um, that, that's the cheapest. If you want it vacuum sealed as a whole bird, that's an additional cost. I want to say it's like 80 cents a, a bird at where we go. Um, and then if you want it parted out, like on styrofoam trays, like you would buy at the grocery, that's going to be an additional cost. Also, something you should keep in mind is to get that USDA seal, um, you're, depending on what butcher you go to and what their regulations are, if you are planning on reselling the meat, you need to, to do a lot of research on that, to resell the meat. But if you're putting it in your own freezer, then you don't need that USDA label. Um, you can also butcher yourself. And I know that might sound a little bit cringy, but it's really pretty easy. It's probably the easiest part of raising them is butchering them. <laughs> yeah? Uh, the ordinance that they passed it, that they can't be butchered in the backyard. Oh, so they did? Mm -hmm. Would you yeah. say that it's pretty unrealistic to have six chickens since you have to buy them in sets of six, so you have to wait till everyone dies, right, to go get another set? Is that what you're saying? No, just from the hatchery. They won't send just like one or two. You have to get six. You have to get a set of six. And then if you have to take them in, so the only way you would get meat chickens is if you take them in, and it would be pretty hard to find someone that would just have six, right? Uh, there, there's butcher uh, butchers around that will do just six. Okay. Yeah. Um, the one that we go to that does that. It's down near a courthouse. It's actually a drive-through. I don't know if you want to hear how it goes. <laughs> I'm curious. <laughs> it's, it's actually a drive-through. Like you take them and um, you just it, it's literally a drive-through butcher. And I'm trying to they, come. they open oh, okay. the garage door and there's the guy in the knife and they With his axe. It's a pretty quick then. process. Yeah. Um, I have so many questions. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to get you said something about within a 30 mile radius, if there's an outbreak, they need to know where the chickens are. Yeah. So would you say it's pretty critical that we know where the chickens are in the car model? I mean, that's for ODA. Like, they're looking at major producers. I don't know what they would do with backyard flocks. Um, but they're looking at those major producers, um, the big barns. Yeah. I'm talking about trying to feed. I've been doing you know, two organic classes. You know. Oh, okay. So anyway, you know, both of them had chickens. You know, and, but however, my job was to take the scraps, table scraps, out to the chickens. The first time I ever did it, the chickens, they said, "Be careful," you know, because you get scared. Well, at night they were roosting up here above the compost pile. You know where I was supposed to. <laughs> but anyway, chickens, uh, table scraps. Yeah. You know, you know, uh, they told us that, that you can cut down your feed bill by giving them table scraps. So, okay. I so, don't. Uh, you, you probably would because of your commercial <clears throat> facility, but as a backyard person. Well, as a backyard person, you can feed them table scraps. We feed ours table scraps. Um, what you want to be careful of is um, if you're giving them a complete feed that has everything they need, all their nutrition is in that feed. So if you give them your backyard scraps, it's really kind of like a snack to them. And so it's just like us, if we've had a complete balanced meal and then we go to the cabinet and get extra stuff, then our, our diet can be out of whack. And so you just want to be cautious of that. Um, especially if you're doing it as part of their diet, that's where I would talk to your feed, um, feed specialist at a feed mill and say, I'm probably going to be giving them this amount of, you know, lettuce and tomatoes and, or whatever it might be so that they can create a formula for you that accounts for those extra nutrients. Because sometimes too much of a nutrient can be a problem. Like I mentioned, um, pullets which are young females that haven't started laying yet, if they get too much calcium before they start laying, that can be toxic. So 
if they get too much of a nutrient, that can also be a problem. So in moderation, you can give them table scraps, uh, but you just want to be cautious and talk with the specialists about it. You had said that <clears throat> each bird needed like three to four foot inside yeah. square foot. If they're a, a egg, -laying egg bird. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't catch how, how much room you said they needed for outside. I would say eight to ten feet. I don't know if, um, I mean, per bird. Mm -hmm. You could look up what the USDA guidelines are on it, um, but that's just my personal recommendation. Okay, with that, we appreciate what you brought forth tonight, Amy. Um, we have another young lady, uh, I believe it's Elizabeth. She's not here. Is there anyone from the Clark County Health Department here? I guess not. So, consequently, we were supposed to have somebody from the health department. So, I guess with that point, we'll go into uh, the rest of the agenda. <coughs> Mr. Bridge. Do you want to see if she wants to pack up and head out before we go on? She's not here for the duration, our guest. Go ahead. Ma'am, do you want to pack up and head out, or you want to stay for the whole meeting? It's it's completely up to you. It might be a long meeting. Just give you a heads up. And I will pack up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to pack up and leave, you know. Yeah. Have awesome. at it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. And I think it's wonderful that you guys are doing this. There's nothing that I think more rewarding than knowing where your food came from, being able to have raised it. It's great for kids to just have that experience and you know you may not be making money but man are you learning a lot from it so it's something I'm pretty passionate about so I congratulate you guys on taking that step I think it's pretty great. Thank you young lady. Ready? <laughs> we'll get it. Don't worry about that. <laughs> you want to invite me back? I left all the chickens. Oh, you're interesting. <laughs> I have a <like> chicken. <laughs> Thank you. You want to touch base on community yeah. cleanup, <laughs> uh, fireworks, etc.? Uh, we'll we'll get into all that later on. Okay. Yep. Okay. Uh, should I start the manager report, Mayor? Sound Go good ahead. Go? All right, thank you, members of council, members of the public. Uh, city manager report dated June 17th. We'll start off with the service report with our assistant city manager, Mr. Kitko. Thank you, Mr. Bridge, Mayor, members of the council, members of the public. Uh, under our public works department, our citywide dirt patching potholes is nearing completion. Um, if you do see any, uh, give us a shout. We do have some repairs. Um, still to complete that I've spoken about before, but they have definitely not left our list. Um, pickleball court conversion, uh, as I had stated, has been done. The net post sleeves are set in concrete. Uh, it was supposed to be about the end of this week that uh, the company was gonna come around and go ahead and do the painting. Temperatures aren't allowing uh, them to get in. They're getting, gonna back up about another week or two. So um, it, the surfaces are just way too hot to throw down the, the paint on the uh, asphalt. Um, Heritage Hall area has been leveled in topsoil place. Um, we had got rock counted, so everything out here, we got a few rocks to take out by uh, hand. We were looking to hydro seed this week, but in the mid mid 90s, it just it isn't even gonna help because we would have to set everything up with a sprinkler system. So probably looking at maybe even going into the next week when we know we got some rain to help us out. Down into the water department, uh, well five is about, uh, got delayed. Uh, it was supposed to be end of May to early June. Uh, they're backed up on another project, I, I, I believe, in another municipality, but they will be in soon. Uh, lead service and water main replacement project. Uh, we just had a meeting, got to about 30% complete, working with the engineer on layout, where we're going to do shutoffs, how things will work. So we're still in the, the nitty gritty of uh, trying to determine how this contractor would be, it'd be the easiest way for them to produce this job. 
because there is a lot of utilities underground in the old section of town, things that were abandoned, things that are alive, gas, there, there's just so much stuff. So a uh, lot to think about. Uh, the big one I have highlighted on your uh, report is the citywide lead service line inventory update. So there are letters going out to everyone within the city limits. If by chance you live outside the corporation limits and, have, and do not have our city water, just disregard that. Because um, sometimes it's every door delivery and the mailman or woman may have accidentally, some of their routes leave the city after they've delivered in. So what you're gonna get is you're gonna get a flyer that uh, you can f complete the flyer um, in that, um, in that uh, pamphlet and send back to us. You can call us or on our uh, website, uh, Facebook page, there is an online version that you can fill out. And what this does is, you gives you some instructions on what to look for. And what we're looking for is what the type of material your inside water service is. So if it's that nice bronzy look, that co goldish color, it's copper. You know, if you got that shiny looking stuff that looks like maybe lead of a bullet or something like that, pencil lead, you might have lead or you might have galvanized. So we have a, about 2,000 um, line Excel sheet that we are completing for the EPA that we have to turn in by October. So there's multiple ways you can do this. Uh, our utility clerk, our water crews, all can help you out with that. And then if hopefully we get a good turnout, after that then we'll be uh, setting appointments and knocking on your door. Because uh, it is required just so we can get this done. Now. It, everything has to be done regardless of lead, but three sections of our town do not have lead. Only one section does, but it is required for the whole city. So even if you live right next to our water tower up on Scarf, you'll still have to complete this survey. Does it really mean anything other than we're meeting the federal requirement? So if there's any questions, like I said, you can always call the city. We have a bunch of us that are ready to help out. Um, you know, if you're coming in to pay your water bill, we're asking you at that time, hey, go back, maybe we can meet, do things like that. Um, moving on uh, to road resurfacing project, everything was approved, uh, you know, through council. We'll just wait till it's our turn in the project schedule uh, to get our streets and ADA ramp uh, replacements uh, completed. Uh, Carlisle Park phase one upgrade project. Uh, I do already have a fencing contractor uh, scheduled. He said it should be about three weeks out. Um, called a bunch and they're, they're busy. They're like the butchers, I guess. Um, they, they all, everyone I've called out of four or five of them said they're at least seven, eight, ten weeks out. This guy, I told him, I said, we have a priority part and then we're redoing the fence a little bit around the original tennis courts. We're gonna get it tied up, get it squared away. Um, then next year have them come in and go ahead and paint it. Um, so I told them that's last, but at least get me my fence. So he moved this up a couple of weeks to try and get that priority portion done. NatureWorks grant um, is pretty much complete with the installation of the gazebos. There are some items um, that will be added. Uh, we're continuously trying to water that uh, grass down there, hopefully it will take root. Uh, we just did pour a little bit of concrete down there for the ramp for everyone who works down there to be able to take you know stuff out that gate and then um we will start i will start seeking or turning into paperwork seeking our um portion of the reimbursement from the ohio department of natural resources uh did receive my first estimate on um getting the uh area clear for the disc golf course but i'm still waiting on a couple others so I won't at this point you know, give any of that information out until I receive them all. And then under additional items, uh, Metro Project discussion, um, they are pretty much complete with all the underground drilling, things like that. I have heard the Spectrum does have a new subcontractor, a different one in working up in the Willowick Applewood area. And um, I haven't heard as many complaints on this subcontractor as I did the last one. So hopefully things are going a little bit better, but as far as MetroNet, now they're starting to actually pull the fiber in those lines, which is much, much faster than them doing the drilling. So they'll still be getting back there, but they'll be tying in those boxes and things like that. I do have another um, monthly progress report meeting tomorrow at 9 a.m. So uh, if there's any information that comes out about that, I will be sure to pass that on. And then uh, application, uh, we have added to the application for the CDBG allocation funds for Carlisle Park Phase 2. We are adding additional ADA sidewalk, it was initial, driveway, parking area, and security. We're also going to add an additional inclusive park piece. 
we were able to get a few extra bucks than what we initially applied for through that um, through that service. And then um, we did apply for the critical infrastructure grant for Rawson. We'll wait to hear back. Uh, we do compete against others in pretty much Southern Ohio and other LMI qualified areas. Um, but as soon as that comes back and hopefully we're approved, I will let uh, Mr. Bridge and council know. Um, that is my report. I can entertain any questions on anything else going on with the city. Go ahead, Peg. Um, where are we at on the street sweeper? Um, so, uh, I'm going to intersect. I'll be updating council on that tonight with my section. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. I'll call about that. Yeah. We're going to paint curbs and stuff on Main Street once, after. Once everything is swept and everything's killed okay. off. Thank you. You're welcome. What about the five section turn signal head? Where's that go? Um, I understand what that is, I guess. Okay, so currently down at uh, Jefferson and Main Street, we have all the new signals that are up there. Mm -hmm. um, two of those heads, one facing south. So the one you're looking at the two heads facing south on 235, that left signal head will come down. It only has three. It will now go to five sections. So you'll have a red, yellow, green, and then your arrow, and then a green arrow. Um, and then your eastbound lane will also have that same setup. They're the only two. Uh, should be within the next week or so. They will be in, get those signals put up. You'll see new signs put up that says signalization change. Uh, they have to be up for 14 days. And then uh, soon south and eastbound will have a turn green arrow while others are stopped for a certain amount of time. We're looking right now as initial 12 second green arrow and including a three second yellow. Um, uh, atmosphere with that and then we are also because we got a concern a couple times about uh, we up at Lake and Maine sitting next to Speedway on Lake there was big box trucks coming in and tricking the radar at times it had to be over by the white line and high enough and it would signal someone sitting in the turn lane uh, so they'd get a green arrow for no reason <laughs> So we're actually having those radars relocated out to the end of one of the poles. They then get a direct look at that turn lane. Hmm. Okay. So we got two of those to change. So hopefully that will not give that just that extra false seven to 10 seconds. That really is not needed at that time. They can go more to the straight line. Makes sense. Any more though? Mm -hmm. Other than that, we're done. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Moving on to the city manager report, our fire and EMS report with fire chief, chief trustee. Mayor, council, citizens. Uh, for the month of May, the New Carlisle Fire Division responded to 122 EMS calls in the city. The division responded to five fire-related calls, three good and ten calls, and zero false alarms. We had six EMS calls answered by mutual aid by Pike Township. We had 12 uh, EMS calls answered by Bethel Park due to Medic 52 being on a response. We answered three mutual aid calls for Pike Township and six mutual aid calls for Bethel Park. At the time of the report, our run number for the year was 705. We are up now to 737. From the last meeting for reports to this meeting, we've answered 138 calls. Um, we still have smoke alarms at the, st at the station, and when our citizens in the city, they need them, please contact us. We'll either give them to you or come out and install them for you in your home. Uh, smoke detectors do save lives and they are very important and there's no reason for our citizens not to have them and we can provide them for them and install them anyone have any questions for the chief thank you fire chief and moving on with the city manager report the planning and zoning and mayor's court report so in front of council for the period of may 25 through june 7th uh, planning department issued a total of 88 violations um, with a total of 50 properties violated. Uh, we had closed 51 violations. Uh, vacant properties violated were three. Um, one work order issued, two violations submitted to mayor's court, and one property extension granted. Should council have any questions over the planning and zoning and mayor's court report, be happy to entertain that. Um, any questions? Questions? And with the police report uh, for uh, month of May 2024, they took 319 calls, 40 reports, 35 assists, 14 criminal arrests, four felony arrests, eight minor uh, misdemeanor arrests, two warrants, 
64 traffic stops, 35 traffic warnings, 29 moving, moving citations, 413 business checks, four code enforcement follow-ups, six traffic crashes, and zero parking citations. Any questions on the police report from members of council? No? And I'll move on with the finance report, and this is for our uh, fiscal month ending May 2024, uh, but for the month we have receded $831,035, and we expense $640,236. Uh, received a date for the year, $4.6 million. Expenses to date are about $3.6 million. <clears throat> Along with the extensive finance report, we have our bank accounts with our total balance across all funds at just over $9 million. This is also followed by a more detailed bank report. We also have our income tax collections for the month of May. It looks like we did go up, I think, about a percent to 1.8 percent. Um, but again, we always watch this to see how we're above and beyond from last year's income tax collection. This is a great tool to have. And then for a mayor's court report, uh, for the month of, for the current month, they had dispersed 4,828, and the year to date is 18,077. That follows it up with a statement of cash and then the extensive report, which is your revenue expense report. Uh, does council have any questions on the finance report for the month of May? Yes, no. Okay. You just and then, said finance report. Oh, thank you. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Is that Mr. Bond? Okay. Was it Mr. Bond? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Councilman Shammy? Yes. Councilwoman Wright? Yes. Councilman Lindsay? Yes. Vice Mayor Eggleston? Yes. Mayor Cook? Yes. Councilman Grimm? Yes. Councilman Bond? Yes. Move to accept Mayor's financial report. report. Councilwoman Wright? Yes. Councilman Lindsay? Yes. Vice Mayor Eggleston? Yes. Mayor Cook? Yes. Councilman Grimm? Yes. Councilman Bond? Yes. Councilman Shammy? Yes. Thank you. And moving on with the city manager report and our informational items. Um, one of the first bullet topics is potential police cruiser donation to Clark State. I had received an email from um, a Johnny Lehman, and he is director of risk man risk director of risk and emergency management, Clark State uh, College. Um, I'm going to just read the email for the record. It says I wanted to reach out to you in reference of the possibility of a cruiser donation for the Clark State Police Academy. We have a very outdated fleet of Ford Crown Vicks that are experiencing many issues with them. The vehicles are used to allow recruits to experience patrol excuse me to experience a patrol vehicle, make tra traffic stops, etc. We're reaching out to the agencies to see if they can assist us. Please let me know if you have any questions or concerns. What year is our Dodge Charger? I think it's a, oh, eight. eight. I think it's a so right now we have a Dodge Charger. That's the one we use for the decoy. And it's probably, uh, of course, we run this by the assistant city manager because he deals a lot with our police cruisers. Um, valued about five to $6,000. So any time that we want to donate or give away city property, we do not have the authority to do that on the administrative side. That would have to come in the form of a resolution uh, disposing of unneeded or unwanted city property. So I just wanted to put that in council's ear. Um, I will be moving forward with the with the resolution. You guys can either make a motion tonight to just don't want to entertain it, or at least allow us to draft that resolution for you guys can decide on it and go through the regular legislative cycle at that point in time. Any question? Go ahead, Bill. What's the possibility of, of selling that and getting 5000 or whatever off of... Uh, the auction gov or wherever you sell stub deals um i'm not too versed on that so i'll let mr kiko answer that um i'm assuming it's probably got a lot of wear and tear since it's an in-city car that caused a lot of you know start starting and stopping but mr kiko is the gentleman who does all our gov deals so uh, we will defer to him for his um opinion um, most of our vehicles that we've been seeing go through gov deals averages between two and that six thousand dollars as far as pickups uh, vehicles uh, the Impala that went through, which was an 01, it got, uh, I think it brought in 2000 So that's why we're five or six might be right. It just depends on who's on the market that day, what, ch what your charger. People know chargers more than maybe than I do if it has a certain engine, but I know all the chargers that uh, we've had in our fleet 
constant steering arms, you know, things like that over and over and over, fan switches, fans, just, so that's why we got kind of taken out of service in lieu of a new vehicle. So what I'm hearing, the charger isn't in real good mechanical condition or shape. Uh, I can only get a couple of grand maybe from an auction. So why would we donate it to a police uh, class with the possibility of, of it breaking down and hurting somebody? Well, and that'd be their choice. They, they they wanted the car and reached out, but I brought that up to him, and they, it's Clark State, so they have people that can fix it. But once we donate it, that's not our concern. That's for them to take that into account. And he's also, I think, a retired police officer, so I think he knows of all the ins and outs of the issues they had with the Charger fleets. Who's a retired police officer? I think Mr. Lehman is. His twin brother for police. Yes, it's, it's, right. oh, it's, our, okay. it's our police administrator's trim brother, who okay. I think, do believe was. He is time. retired. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't have a problem donating this to, to Clark State for whatever use they can get. And they do have an automotive department there. They can go through it and do whatever they need to do. <clears throat> so what does council have anything else to say on that or not? If not, I'll make a motion to go ahead. Second. and uh, donate the car to Clark State. Well, we need to do a legislation. Okay. That's why That's why I said either motion to stop it or I'm just going to go ahead and do that legislation. That's a charter requirement for that. Okay. So the motion... You got a motion and a second, so... To withdraw, stop it? Withdraw your motion. Or your second. Withdraw my motion. Withdraw my motion. Down. Good. Okay, moving on to city manager report. We have past due Rumpke account. So I got a call from Rumpke. We have quite a number of residents who have not signed up for Rumpke service or have signed up or let their bill go um, into default. So Rumpke did send those uh, residents to collections as they should have. Um, so what we will be doing, um, there is a code section that we do need to enforce that council did pass. So what we will be doing is um, going through that uh, list that we got emailed to us, <coughs> taking out the vacants and taking out some business owners that were on there that shouldn't have been on there. And we're gonna do another round of letter and it's gonna say something along the lines of, you know, um, this is the final attempt. Um, you are required to have the trash service as indicated by this code section. Um, we're also gonna throw in a Harvard revised code section in there as well that gives council the right to uh, pass that type of legislation. Um, we're also going to give a deadline that says you need to have this done. We'll just say for easy discussion on July 1. <coughs> on July 2nd, Rumpke will then run an updated report. Where whoever's left up will be cited into our mayor's court. Or, I'm sorry, not the mayor's court. I think Jake wants to do civil court. So um, I need to revisit my notes on that, but they will be cited into some court, more than likely our mayor's court. Um, but I did want council to know because last time we sent out the letters, we got quite a few phone calls. Um, we dealt with those um, individually at the administrative level, um, but just want to put council on notice because once we do take that net steps and they go into the court system, they may be coming to you know talk to you guys. But at least want to let you guys know what was going on with that. Um, and again, that is all what we are supposed to do with our code since you guys did pass that round of legislation. I'm hoping you know once we send that first letter out, people kind of sign back up and get back on it, and then it's no no harm no foul. Um, but you know, Rumpke is expecting us to kind of assist them with um, holding our citizens accountable and the legislation that backs that up. So if you have any questions on that, please just give me a call, go into a little bit more detail. Um, once I get that letter drafted, I'll go ahead and send council a copy of that um, and then send it out. Can a citizen make a comment? It's not my meeting, ma'am, but you can ask the mayor too, sure. I'm sorry, I didn't. Can I make a comment? Go ahead. Pat Craybacher, 307 North Henry Street, New Carlisle. Um, my only thought is in keeping with the, the theme or the tempo of the charter review, um, you mentioned July 2nd, that's only two weeks away. I think a letter to citizens who may not understand the, the implications of ordinance and things like that, I, I think you should give them at least 60 days. Um, I appreciate your opinion, but this will be probably the second or third letter we sent out to these folks. A lot of them are repeat from the first time around. 
And that was just an example for easy conversation. What do you mean first time around? Because <coughs> we have, we've, this is our third, probably our third round of letters we sent out for people saying, hey, you, you didn't sign up originally, please sign up, you are required to have it. So a lot of these folks on the list have known since De December of last year they needed to actually sign up for this. So it's been an ongoing, ongoing thing. It's not, it's the first time out the window. So. Know, but you're playing, you're going to play hardball now, so. I'm so sorry. I didn't realize other letters had gone out. Yeah, yeah. If I was a citizen, I would want at least 60 days. Well, this, this is no different than what waste management had. Uh, mm -hmm. My only concern, if Rumpke picks up the toters. They're not picking our, up the toters. That's why we're helping them. They don't want to pick up the toters. Right. Mm -hmm. But if they do, is there a charge to now bring them back for our contract? Well, that'd be up to the homeowner to pay, not for the city. Uh, it all I, comes back to the homeowner. I mean, it, it, no, it, it, no, it, it, no. it does. No, 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 no. What I'm asking, mm -hmm. can Rumpke charge for that? They would not charge us. They would charge the consumer. I understand that. <clears throat> I'm, I'm that, sure they could. Is I it in our contract that gives them that leeway? I, we, there, I, I can't answer that. But them, if it's not, I'm sure they have an all-catching clause on there like they do when they want to close down for high heat. It's, it's, a, it's charges sent out. But again, these are citizens who are very aware that they needed to be signed up for the service. So any kind of fees at this point in time is going to be on them for not following the rules, and especially not adhering to a first couple of letters <coughs> sent out. But no, they would not charge us. They would be passed right. on to them. But I don't know the answer to, to that. The, so I'll reach out to Shonda and find out. No email, you guys. Right. But I'm almost positive they will have something. Bill. How many people are we talking, Dina? You know? Right now it's 140, but we haven't went through the list and took out. 140 mm -hmm. residents? Yep. But again, there's a few vacants and a few business in there. So once we get through the list, probably 120. Why would your businesses be in there? I mean, I'm just asking. Because it's data. They, it's, they set out cards for people who shouldn't have service, like businesses. Okay. Or a main street that was just accidentally, you know, dropped off. And we've had Rumpke now for... Started end of December. Yeah. A few months. Mm -hmm. okay. right. Thank you. Anyone else? Bill. <clears throat> I have a question on how much that's going to cost the citizens that didn't pay their bill that have to go to what I forgot what you called that other court, but it's, so it's not going to mayor's court. It's going to I don't know what court we're going to put it in, but again, they'll be we have to go we have to do some court measure to have them comply. But what would the court charge be approximately? I, I don't know off the top of my head. According to uh, ten sixty point ninety nine, the penalty. Whoever violates or fails to comply with any of the provisions of this cha chapter is guilty of a minor misdemeanor. Fine shall be shall be fined not more than one hundred dollars for each offense. A separate offense shall be deemed committed each day during or on which a violation or noncompliance continues. So consequently. If you read this, <clears throat> hundred dollars a week. That'd be seven hundred dollars a week. Could get kind of expensive. I don't think the magistrate is going to do that. The point of it well, is just get the people to sign up and follow the rules and regulations that they're supposed to be signed and signed up for. Entirely yeah. up to the magistrate, mm -hmm. but it's in what we have passed in the past. Yeah. Anything else that you've got? Continue? Yeah. All right. So Clark County Let's Save Program, I've had this in here now for the past few meetings. Please take a look at that. If you have lead in your house, you are eligible to do some uh, funding through Clark County to get that removed, the abatement process. There is income limits because it is for low to monitor and income houses. But this information is available in our packets. Please look at our website, too, if you have any questions on that. Definitely take advantage of it. Uh, Cloud County Multiple Jurisdiction Hazard Mitigation Plan. Um, so Fire Chief and I will be meeting with the EMEA Director. Is that this week or next week? This week. Sir. This week, yeah. Thursday? Yeah. Thursday the 29th. Yeah. Um, to start developing the small little um, plan that we want to implement here. Um, I was going to work on it a little bit by myself, but I decided just to hold off because I don't know what the EMEA Director can add to it or want to take away. 
So again, it's just that short little thing we're going to look at to where we, you know, obviously have our fire department in place and fire chief in there, maybe some key administrators to do some um, PO uh, um, uh, approval and stuff like that. But for the most part, it's going to be let fire chief just really work with the county EMA to really use the best best practices that they have to help our citizens as well. Um, City Council strategy and retreat session that is Saturday, June 22nd from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. That is at the fire station that is open to the public. So we have all filled out our surveys. I do think he is still missing two from the elected officials. So the two of you who did not do that, if you could do that survey, if you are planning or not attending that event, that would be greatly appreciated. Uh, but again, it is to the public is basically council's way to get together and say, hey, this is where we want our city to go for the next 10, 20 years, five, 10 years. It's really just that visioning that council wants for the city. So long overdue, very excited to get that going. Uh, policy items council's working on. We still have the boards and commission handbook. Um, that is about 90% done. The administration's put a lot of hard work into that. So definitely need council on board to really finish out the projects, but we need to determine what kind of committees you guys want to form. Um, I gave some examples at the last one, so I don't know if council has had any more discussions on that, but just put it on your radar again that that is about 90% done and we do want to complete that. <coughs> Uh, charter review through uh, uh, or preamble through Article 4. It says attached here. I'm sorry. That was just left over from last week. I did email council what Jake had summarized from the last meeting when I was not present. Um, so please take a look at that. Maybe for the next meeting, have some guidance on that if it's all correct or not. That way we can go ahead and start drafting that legislation and get it on the ballot. And again, I commend you guys for coming together and getting that done. It was a couple year process, but uh, so close to getting that done as well. So hopefully we can move forward with that and get that completed. <laughs> Upcoming legislation, there's quite a few. Um, bonding of cities, certain employees. I know this has been on there for a few months. I'm still looking in to see if we can get refunded on our current bonding uh, deal that we have uh, with through a, another bonding company. I want to get it all bonded through our liability insurance company. So it's one, um, one basically ticket, one under one roof there. Monroe, Medis uh, Monroe Meadows TIF legislation round one. That is coming. I wish I had a solid date for everyone. But I just don't. We're still waiting on information. Uh, back from them, basically how they want to fund that bond issue. So um, once we hear that, we will definitely do that legislative process as well. That is also time consuming. That is one where we introduce it, has to sit for, I think, 30 to 60 days, and you have to vote on it, then it has to sit again for another 30, 60 days. So it is a quite timely process, but we'll get that started here as soon as we get the <coughs> supplement information we need from the developer. Then we have a slew of amendments that we're going to do to so some chapters that we have that we come across. 850 is our, our basically our peddler policy. We want to add that no-knock registration to that. So um, I'm about done with that. So we'll be adding that. And then some various uh, adding enforcement and additional language to certain um, sections of our code to allow that to be enforceable in mayor's court. Um, and then two, chapter 248, which is our city policy section. We want to add that incentive pay, policy, incentive pay policy. The council approved that memorandum of understanding with the union, um, but I just got the signage back. So from the union, uh, not saying that they would not agree to paying their employees more, but we still wanted to wait to see if they're going to sign that. Now that we have it back in our possession, we do want to officially put that in our policy section. So excited about that. I do have a few additional discussion topics. Um, one is the retreat that we're going to be having is from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. It's kind of a rather long day. I do think that we should get it catered. I do want council's opinion on that. Since it's not my meeting, I do want to facilitate everyone being comfortable. Um, we're also going to be catering for the community cleanup. So we'd like to just order additional um, food items um, through the catering order that we're going to do for community cleanup. Um, discussion or thoughts? I have a question Go ahead, on Bill. something else. I don't have a question on the catering. I do have a question on the do knock registry. Okay. <clears throat> I know we, we have a lot of people here that we don't normally have. If you wouldn't mind explaining to them, the citizens, what that is. Yeah. Unless it's gone out through the mail or something and I didn't see it. Mm -hmm. No, it wouldn't be mailed yet. We're just now developing the policy. Just gave the presentation not too long ago. Yeah. Um, but a lot of cities have it, so basically it's a no-knock registry. If you don't like people knocking on your door to sell you stuff, you sign up for the registry. And then everyone who gets a peddler's permit will actually get a copy of that list and they're not supposed to knock on your door. Um, ideally, it's always best to have uh, the homeowner itself, but no soliciting or do not, you know, no, don't knock on their own doors as well. Uh, it's a practice that a lot of cities have done. 
And on top of that, we're actually going to start putting the list of approved peddler permits on our website. So basically, if you have a question if this person has a permit or not, you can go to the website, find out if it's active or not. So we're going to make a lot of changes to that. New Carlisle, for some reason, just has an uniquely odd amount of peddlers that come into our city, um, more so than any other place I've been. It's just weird how it happens, but it does happen here. Um, but we get a lot of complaints on that peddler being too forceful, et cetera, not having a permit, whatever the case may be. Just again, it's just another policy to help protect our, our citizens. Great question, Mr. Lindsay. Thank you for the recommendation. Back to the question at hand. What do you think about them ordering the food? Where are you ordering it from? We haven't decided yet, sir. <clears throat> Panera, something like that. Doesn't matter to me one way or the other, but. I need a motion in a second. So, uh, I'll make the motion. You got one. Okay. Is the motion to order the cater it? Order the cater. Okay. We got. Oh, you can be the second. Yeah. Yep. Did he second? Second. It? second. 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 Still. Right. Okay. <laughs> or. And that'd be just catering for the participants. We can't cater to, for the audience because we don't know who's going to be there. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Councilman Grimm? Yes. Councilman Bond? Yes. <clears throat> Wait a minute. Hold on a minute. Start over. I did the wrong one. <clears throat> Councilman Lindsay. She was yeah. the second. Oh, I thought somebody got <laughs> I did got it. I looked at it. Cooks. Commissioner <clears throat> Eggleston? Yes. Mayor Cook? Yes. Councilman Grimm? Yes. Councilman Bond? Yes. Councilman Chammy? Yes. Councilwoman Wright? Yes. So we are catering. Awesome. Um, thank you for that. So someone asked an earlier question regarding the sweet sweeper. So that is on as planned. It's going to be a little bit longer than what we anticipated. Um, so we found out late last week, early last week, I um, got a call. Kind of took me by surprise, to be honest with you, from the bank. He is wanting us to do bond council. So I'm like, why are we doing bond council? It's a commercial loan. Well, they let us know that in January of 24, the auditor released opinion 24-02 that basically states that cities should do bond efforts instead of just straight commercial lending. So the f we are still financing the street sweeper, it's just a different type of financing. So I wanted to look at some things. I wanted to look at, one, the legal opinion, that I mean the auditor opinion, and I have Jake looking at it further so we get a more detailed legal explanation of it. Um, but we have to abort the commercial lending side of things and do a bond. So it really doesn't change much. It's just a, dending, a, a different funding structure. It's just, just gonna be a little bit more expensive because with bond, because bond counsel. So you have to have attorneys look at that kind of stuff. So um, the original price was, I think we were on a budget about 300K. The actual sweeper, sweeper came in and lower. What was the total amount? Do you know, not putting on the spot? What was the down payment or was it total with? Yeah. Uh, two, about 225. 225, so we came in under. Um, but we do have to do that bond council route. So um, on July 1, you'll have that first intro, and it'll be second read July 17th, effective date July 30th. And then at that point in time, we will be able to uh, go ahead and secure the um, sweet sweeper. Um, with it being a bonding effort, the bonding company will not do anything until that legislation is actually effective. Not so much council voted on it, but the effective date. So that would be July 30th. So Mr. Kiko, I had him call the gentleman who has the street sweeper. They're willing to hold it. But again, I just wanted to let you guys know that we, we have to do a bonding structure now and you're gonna have to have vote on the legislation. My advice to you is go ahead and pass that legislation since we have everything ordered and move on. It's just the state of a, you know, the auditor opinion really what has forced us to change this. So again, we were looking at this last year. That opinion was not out there. It really came out of January 24. So that's really the gist of it. It's we're, we're going to finance it. It's just a different form of financing. Any comment? Go ahead, Bill. So because the auditor makes an opinion, the city has to abide by his opinion? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is it county auditor or state it's auditor? State auditor. State auditor. So Auditor Yost made this opinion. I, I don't know who did it at the auditor's office. It's an auditor opinion. He's the auditor, forth. so 
And I thought we already had this financed. Mm, they were doing the paperwork, and that's when they were determined they at that point in time that that's when they discovered it had to be a bond instead of a commercial lender. And how much more is this going to cost us? Um, the financing is it's, a, it's the bond council. He said that could be a, from there in no no more than five thousand, depending on how what that looks like. But it can, of course, we'll have our own attorney look at some things too. So I'm expecting it to be a little bit. I would hope to be about five or six thousand dollars more than what we originally planned the budget. I mean, planned to pay for. But again, I just want to stress that. You also came down from a three hundred thousand dollar balance to two hundred twenty five. What's the down payment? That's with everything, right? Twenty some thousand. So we're financing about two hundred and one or two hundred and one. So it's still well under the amount of the three hundred thousand that I think that you know we approach you guys with. But it all came down to them do, starting to do the bank process and then coming out to find out that it had to been a bond. So I was taken back uh, a little bit because you know. It uh, Thank you. Go ahead with your thoughts, sir. Oh, no, I was just taking it back. It, it makes no sense that an opinion would have such an impact since it isn't law, is what I'm getting at. Well, it's, well it's, it's a little bit more than opinion, it's a requirement. So I would just keep that in mind. You know, that's just really the title of it. They give all their opinions all the time, but you have to comply to it. It's not like you can pick and choose. Hmm. Anything further on that? Yes. Is there any benefit to that? It's just been to, it's just, and the benefit is to the lender. So they, they, they know they're going to get their stuff. That's really the benefits too. It doesn't benefit us at all. Let's make it more difficult and more expensive. Well, talk to your local, talk, talk to your elected representatives at the state level. I don't know what to say to that. <laughs> you know? What if we pay it? <laughs> so I, I figured that'd be a question. So I did work with Mr. Mrs. Harris. So my immediate response was just have the general fund pay for it, have the street department pay it back. But we're making just too much money off our interest right now. It's just, it's so uh, we are pulling in 41000 a month in interest. We don't want to take that away. And really it's, it's I don't want to say it's cheap interest rate. I wish it was lower. Um, but Ms. Harris's final recommendation was to keep continue on with the financing. Go ahead, Mr. Bond. What is the interest rate? Five point five. Five point five. Five point five or five point six. I guess five. That's not terrible. <clears throat> and we're making more than that on interest income, so we don't want to take pull that out of the interest bearing account. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, that's where we're at. Follow up. Is that the new rate or the what the current what the current rate would have been had this not happened? The five point six. No, I think that's all this. I don't think the interest rates changed. That was the rate I got months ago, and it hasn't come down. Yeah. Okay. All right. As long as it didn't go up, so I'm getting that. Mm -hmm. all right, thank not. you. And then I do have one more update, but I'm actually going to kindly wait to see what goes down for members of the comment of the public. And it has to do with some ordinances that are on for vote tonight. But before we get to those, then I'll interrupt council politely and give my opinion on that. I just don't know if something's going to come to the clerk of council or not. So my last point, I'll hold off until legislation point. Okay, I have one question. Yes, sir. Since we're into this uh, heat wave, mm -hmm. do we think that uh, we possibly may have to put together some kind of a plan for a cooling center? Go ahead, Chief. Already done, sir. Next, what? That's about cooling centers for the city. It's already been done. The library is a cooling center, mm -hmm. and the Church of the Brethren there we go. is a cooling center also. Great. Good. And it's notified through the uh, county EMA. And they put out that list uh, today. Uh, didn't what you guys do? Uh, well, but those two those two buildings are set up as cooling centers for the city. They really set the today. You said that was that was today. They released that. Yes, sir. Okay. I you, I sent you and uh, assistant city manager email. Okay, we'll get it on Facebook. Will you post that on Facebook? Thank you for being on top of it. One other thing I want to do, I want to thank uh, 
Vice Mayor Eggleston and uh, Councilman Grimm for their support and help down at the coffee and donuts Saturday uh, down at the market. It was an interesting situation. Uh, I thought we had a good crowd. Uh, a lot of people stopped in and saw those of us that were there and uh, some fairly intelligent questions. There were some that weren't so intelligent, but we got through them. What helps bribing us with food? Yep. Yeah, we had donuts and pizzas, so if any of you missed it, we'll know next time. So are you done? Yes, sir. All right. I guess uh, there are no committee reports that I'm aware of. Um, comments from members of the public. Please limit yourself to five okay. minutes no, or less. Email, you will be on the timer and send an email. we'll go from there. Mike, have you got something? Oh, yeah. I guess I do. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, Mike Lowry, 16 Plumwood Drive. Um, so, yeah, I want to first off thank um, Jim Lethley and uh, all the uh, citizens that I spoke to over these past four to five days. Uh, it was I had some really interesting conversations. Um, learned, you know, learned a lot from people who were pro for uh, chickens and, and, you know, people who also had comments about not wanting them. Um, the, the most impressive thing over, over talking with all these people was is um, there were people that signed the referendum petition that were for the chickens, which was really impressive to me because the way they looked at it was is that even though they wanted it, they liked the idea that the city as a whole, you know, I want it, she, or I don't want it, she does, and, and so on. Everybody gets a voice in the matter. And that's a great thing about the way of our government is structured. That everybody can have a voice in the matter. What's that? Correct. Well, they will, or hopefully they will. So, um, you know, I thank the council members that did sign it, and, and again, thanks to all the citizens that signed it, and and uh, it was it, it was interesting conversations with a lot of them. Um, Peggy, thank you for inviting the young lady from the um, Ohio State or FFA. That was that should have been done a lot sooner. I think that would have been in, instrumental in, in structuring the proposed um, ordinance for the chickens. It was it was pretty interesting stuff. So thank you for that. Um, that's all I really got. I, I I talked to a lot of people. I've presented the clerk with the the more than enough signatures to uh, move forward with sending it to the Board of Elections. And as long as they certify it, which there's more than enough to do so, um, unless I made some clerical error on the on signing it or something and filling out the paperwork, um, it'll come back to council and the council in the city. And I assume until that, as of today, it stops the ordinance, does it not? Did, I, did you officially hand something into the court? Yeah, I gave it to Ms. Burner before the meeting started. Okay. Yeah, so that does pause it. So I sent cancel the email from Jake, but I forwarded it off. Um, and I'm, I'm not really should be talking on this because it's not my spot to do so. So do you know anything about it? Or would you like me to continue? I'll file the paperwork tomorrow with the Board of Elections. Um, they have 15, 10 days to get it back. And as long as everything is correct, and there are enough signatures, then it will go to the ballot on our next regular election. Yeah. I spoke with uh, Jason at the Board of Elections just to ask him. I said, you know, because I've never done one of these before, I asked him, I said, when this gets turned in, because today technically would have been the day it was active. Tomorrow. Is, is it tomorrow? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm sorry, tomorrow. I said, you know, since it would go into effect tomorrow, I turn these in, how does that work? And he said, you know, well, I'm not an attorney, but with the Board of Elections, dealing with the municipalities in the past, they have always instantly stopped the ordinance in, from going into effect. For example, if, if we turn this in and it goes, it would be kind of senseless to allow chickens to you know, go for you know, four or five months and then say November, if it was to fail, it would just kind of be 
you know, pointless to do that. So, but that's what Jason told me. That was just his opinion. He said he wasn't attorney or anything like that. So, anything that he was dealing with with other referendums, that's how it usually works. So, that's all I have. Thank you. I'll read what was sent counsel for the record. And this is the opinion of the city attorney. It says Randy, according to section 10.01 of the city charter, section 731.29 of Ohio's Ray Code, and Dan Dino versus Hoover. When an ordinance recently passed by council is to be placed on the ballot, the ordinance is suspended from becoming law until the results of the referendum are announced. So with that being said, since he did officially submit to your clerk of council, uh, that ordinance is on pause and it will not become effective until after the referendum. It puts on the balance and your citizens decide on it. So with what I was gonna say earlier, because I was gonna wait, because I didn't know any of that went down, um, we're also suggesting that council go ahead and table ordinance um, 20, sorry, let me get my glasses off. Ordinance 2024-28, and namely, you know, that is highly recommended because since this is going to the ballot now, let's just say the citizens vote in favor of it and they do not want chickens, there is no ordinance to amend. So basically 28 would be amending a section that doesn't exist, okay? So that's issue one. And then the two, the second one is the table of that has to do with uh, changing the permit schedule to allow for coops. Well, we don't want that to pass because it's gonna be confusing until we know what's going on with the um, referendum. The solution to this is to bring legislation back to council um, on this July 1st. I can put you on so I can see you. And basically, it will be adding a restriction section to section 6.18, which governs your animals. Um, so when you have big sections like that, they usually end the .99, that's usually your penalty. And you have a whole area of stuff to add throughout time. Right now, I think we end at 6.19. Um, so we would be adding a 6.898, and it'd be restrictions. And it's basically just going to say, at any time, if chickens are permitted in the city, these are the restrictions, and it will just be the restrictions that are set forth in 28. The ordinance would not mention any code section. It would not have a numbering system. It would just say, in the event that it does come in, these are the restrictions. In November, once you know it passes or fails, if it passes, then you guys go and you add a, a, a section onto that um, animal to allow for, you know, the, it'd be 6.8.21 and you'll have the same restrictions that you have a restriction just under that 6.821 that guides chickens. So really up to council, um, but that's a recommendation um, from our, the attorney. Um, it makes sense after we, we talked about it. I think I'm gonna advise you guys to do the same thing because if not, it just might become really complicated down the road should anything pass or not pass with the referendum. Mr. Mayor, <coughs> oh, a question for Mr. Bridge. After the November election, how long before it takes effect? I don't know. That's a good question. I think, I don't know. I'll, have to, I'll get the answer for you. Let us know. Yeah, yeah, that's a good, very good question. We have time. A little bit, we do. <laughs> yes. So I don't know if that's like, it's effective January 1 or is it effective like the next day after it's certified? It may be once the certified results are out, then it's effective. Um, but that's a really good question. I don't think anyone thought to ask that, so thank you. I'm done. You're done. Go ahead, Kathy. Are we going to get something to read? Because I'm a much better reader than I am a listener. Can I get something to read? Or did you send us something already that says all that? I haven't sent anything out okay. yet. Yeah. We, me and Jake, had a discussion at 530 today. Okay. Because <laughs> you are going to get us something to read? I can send it out in an email form, sure. I would appreciate yep. that. Thank you. Not a problem. Mm -hmm. Anyone else in the crowd got anything up? Go ahead, Pat. Pat Craybacher, 307 North Henry Street, New Carlisle. So, I mean, I've said this a couple times before, and I don't know what the, I was going to sign Mike's uh, petition, but then it didn't happen last two weeks ago, and I don't know what it says because I haven't seen it. I think that's your point. You haven't seen I it. I haven't yet. seen it either. Um, but it's really not about chickens. It's about food security, and your, your citizens are concerned about having access to quality food, and if they can do something in their backyard um, that will help their kids to eat better or cut down their grocery bills. Have you bought a chicken lately? They're like 12 bucks, which is not bad. 
for a whole chicken if you want to cook a pot of chicken soup. But I'm just saying it's not about chickens. And I, I hope in the um, referendum doesn't villainize the chickens. It's really about food security and citizens having the access to do some things in their yard, which could include raising chickens for eggs, raising chickens for meat, gardening theoretically. So do something, plant something, eat healthy, because food is medicine. Thanks. Go ahead, Mike. I just wanted to answer the, the referendum is the petition. There's no language that says chickens are you know, this, this, and that, or they're good or bad. The, the, the ordinance is on the petition, and that's it's the, the, the referendum is basically it. It's you're given to have the opportunity to vote yes or no on your ordinance. That's all it is. That there's no language as far as Chicken Why is there a cop right around on a bike instead of being in here? It's basically giving you the right to vote on their Yeah, board. that's all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If there's no one else, got anything, go ahead, young lady. So my name is Brandy Lowry, 315 Prentice Drive. And I just want to bring up a very valid point and see if maybe a change can be made to the ordinance, if even if it doesn't pass as far as allowing chickens full time. Um, my son is a 4-H member here locally and has been for six years, I think, um, between Clover Buds and 4-H. He has raised poultry the entire time he has been in 4-H. Um, my nephew, both my nephews have been in 4-H and FFA locally. Um, so for him, raising poultry is not just about the chickens. Um, and we would love to be able to raise them at our house because it makes it so much easier that he can care for them daily. So my question for you is if the ordinance to have chickens as a backyard flock does not pass, is it possible to have something put in to where our 4-H and FFA members can raise market chickens, they're in your house, they're in your backyard for two months. You have them all of June, you have them most of July, then they leave. That is all that we particularly want and need to have in our household is market chickens for fair because for him with 4-H and next year going into FFA he doesn't just learn how to raise a chicken he's learning time management he's learning responsibility he's learning how to budget things because he has to go with me to buy all the feed all the materials all of that and then he has to sit and handwrite letters that go out to businesses and everybody to help raise money. The money that he earns from taking these chickens to fair, he puts into an account for college. So by you not changing this or allowing this to happen, you're now taking money away from a child to go to college. Because without this, he's not going to be able to go. So that is something that I want to bring up is look at all of your 4-H and FFA members that live in the city that may need this, not just for food insecurity, but that is a huge factor because the chickens that we don't take to fair go in our freezer. So that is something that we eat on, not a lot because we usually only get 6 to 12 chickens, but that's still meat that I didn't have to go to the store and purchase. And I know what's going in all of my chickens. So I just ask that if there can be an allowance for 4-H and FFA members for market chickens. I think this is something that possibly council will want to take in their under advisement depending upon what happens down the road. Is this something that he is able to continue raising his market chickens in our backyard for ease of access this year so that he can raise them appropriately. I would make a recommendation. I don't know whether you know Scully Tipton. I don't. All right. He works down at uh, FYI. Okay. And he has a chicken coop down there. He also has the garden down there. Uh, like a community garden and he works with a lot of the people down there I would suggest you put him in contact with your son and the two of them possibly can work down there and raise his chickens there due to the fact that this is not going to be decided until November 
So you're going to have a lengthy period of time okay. before anything is decided. And I appreciate the option, but here's my next question. Who's going to take him to go take care of the chickens in the morning before, because I have work? Who's going to take care of that for me? Well, the possibility of maybe he can tie in with Scully. Scully goes down there, I believe, almost every evening, if not every other day. But I, if you wish, I will get you uh, Scully's name and number and possibly have you discuss with him. But <clears throat> as far as something happening between now and November, I don't foresee it happening. So the end result now is that I have to find somewhere else for my son to raise his market chickens so that he can take a fair project. At this point with the city laws, yes. Okay. Bill, have you got something? Ma'am, 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 yes. the short answer to your questions is you cannot have chickens in the city until after the referendum is voted on in November. It no longer matters what the children, what's best for our kids, that's what I've heard today. So I appreciate that. that. That's sad, but. It is incredibly yeah. sad that you're now taking money away from my son to go to college. So thank you all for that. If you'd like to contribute, I'll gladly give you my Venmo, Cash App, PayPal, whatever you like, so that I can get some money. My child did great in that today. I drove her to the bar four times a day, every day, for four years. If we're done with the, go ahead, Dave. Uh, David Peters, 1685 Addison, New Carlisle Road. Mr. Bridge said something about uh, potentially saying if you have chickens, this, these are the rules that would be around them. And I would just urge council again to make those rules that you have to have a 100 foot setback and at least one acre. Because that's what most cities and townships do. And there's a reason behind it. And there's a long standing tradition of that with being what's best for the municipality. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Mayor. Go ahead, Nick. Ma'am, we're not taking anything away from anyone. This ordinance has been in effect. Hasn't even been in effect yet. No, I mean <clears throat> the ban on uh, farm animals. It's been in effect for decades. Mm -hmm. um, this is something you should have known when you moved into the city. We're not taking anything away from anyone. If you want, if he wants to raise chickens where there's a will, there's a way. Will you then please provide me with housing? I'm not going to provide you anything. So that I can move outside of the city limits? I'm not going to provide you anything, well. ma'am. Thank you. Raising your family is your responsibility, not my. I already raised my family. <clears throat> with that, we're going to move on to the resolutions and ordinance sections. Mrs. Verner. We have no resolutions. We have Ordinance 2024-27. This was introduced on June 3rd, public hearing in action tonight. An ordinance authorizing the city manager to execute a memorandum of understanding that amends the collective bargaining unit's job classification and wage table. So moved. Second. A motion and a second. Mr. Bridge. Uh, explanation of this ordinance. So we had talked about moving our cemetery super, I mean our street superintendent over to our cemetery operations and uh, during budget discussions and we did that. So we had to create a wage scale in our union agreement for that. Um, so that's what this ordinance is and then we also found some additional errors that we had from the previous amendment we did um, with the Excel sheet formulas that was tied into it. So it's basically adding a wage section for cemetery, cemetery superintendent and then cleaning up an error that we had with the data table. Any further comments? Go ahead, Mr. Bond. So we already have a cemetery superintendent. We just didn't have their wages documented on the wage table. Is that what you're saying? We, we, we had a cemetery superintendent job classification, but the position wasn't active. Our street superintendent just kind of went down there and did all the stuff. So we're making him the official cemetery superintendent then we'll be replacing him in the street superintendent category position. Do we need a cemetery superintendent? Yes. Okay. 
who, I guess I, I'm kind of, un, I guess, unclear on the history of this or whatever. Um, if he was doing that. Is it an operational error because now the street department is not well managed because their manager is always down at the cemetery doing stuff? Gotcha. So it's, yes. Okay. So we have to hire somebody then new to take the street. Well, more than likely end up hiring within. Or, yeah, 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 from the sure. or whatever. But it's, right. a, it's, uh, it's an operational change. <clears throat> gotcha. Okay. Mm -hmm. I was thinking we were creating another. Yeah. Good question. Great question. Another line there. Sure. Any for, else? for a thing that's already a liability to us. Sure. Uh, as a city. So, okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Mr. Burr. Councilwoman Wright? Yes. Councilman Lindsay? Yes. Vice Mayor Eggleston? Yes. Mayor Cook? No. Councilman Grimm? Yes. Councilman Bond? Hmm. Yes. Councilman Shammy? Yes. Passes six to one. The next one is Ordinance 2024-28. This was introduced on June 10th. Public hearing and action tonight. An ordinance amending Section 618.21 of the Codified Ordinances regarding the keeping of chickens at residential properties within city limits. Mr. Mayor. This is tabled. Move to table. I have a motion to table. Second. Eggleston to table. <coughs> Any comment? Mayor Cook? Yes. Councilman Grimm? Yes. Councilman Bond? Yes. Councilman Chammy? Yes. Councilwoman Wright? Yes. Councilman Lindsay? No. Vice Mayor Eggleston? Yes. That Passes six to one. That was All right. Ordinance 2024-29. <coughs> this was introduced on June 10th. Public hearing in action tonight. An ordinance amending ordinance 2018-08 for the purpose of updating the fee schedule for miscellaneous fees and permits required by the city of New Carlisle, Ohio. So, uh, moved to table. Is that the table? Yes. Second. Eggleston Shannon to table. Any discussion? Yeah. Councilwoman Wright? Yes. Councilman Lindsay? No. Vice Mayor Eggleston? Yes. Mayor Cook? Yes. Councilman Grimm? Yes. Councilman Bond? No. Councilman Shannon? No. That passes four to three. And our last one is a read only. We have ordinance 2024 30, introduction tonight, public hearing <coughs> action on July 1st, 2024. An ordinance adopting the tax budget for the city of New Carlisle, Ohio, for the fiscal year beginning January 1, 2025, and submitting the same to the auditor of Clark County, Ohio. In other business, we have the city offices will be closed on June 19th to observe Juneteenth. We have our community cleanup and document shred event on Saturday, June 22nd from 8 a.m. to 11 a.m. at 621 Walsh Drive. City Council planning and strategy session will be held on Saturday, June 22nd at the fire station from 9 to 2. The community garage sale will be held Saturday and Sunday, June 29th and June 30th. Fireworks show Saturday, June 29th at dusk at Haddock's Field. The rain out date is Sunday, June 30th. We will have movie night, the first annual movie night, on Saturday, June 29th after the fireworks show at Haddock's Field. And it's open for any discussion on city related business. Anyone have anything else to bring forth? Mr. John? No out of order i have something i'm going to bring up last couple of sessions we've had uh, 
kind of Donnybrook here. I've been in touch with the Ethics Committee, Municipal League, and basically looking at the Ohio Revised Code. The supervision of conduct of officers. The mayor shall supervise the conduct of all officers of the municipal corporation, inquire into and examine the grounds of all reasonable complaints against such officers, and cause their violations or neglect of duty to be promptly punished or reported to the proper authority for correction. We've had a couple of instances of uh, unprofessional conduct at this table. Professional conduct is a set of at attitudes, behaviors, and the characteristics deemed desirable in members of a profession. Engaging in clear, open, and honest communication and professional responsibility applies to those professionals making judgments, applying their unique skills, and reaching informed decisions for and behalf of others of which we were appointed to these positions and elected to. That's all I have. If you want to make a motion to adjourn, we so move. So move. So go ahead. Oh. At the meeting that we had on June 10th, Mr. Lindsay made a comment that there is nothing in the city code stating that dogs had to be registered. Section 618.08. Okay. And by registration, you mean getting a license? Yes. That's because we follow state law, ma'am. It's also in the city. You have the floor. I'm done. You're done? We've got a motion on the floor for adjournment. Do I hear a second? second. I think Chris did. <laughs> Councilwoman Wright? Yes. Councilman Lindsay? Yes. <clears throat> Vice Mayor Eggleston? Yes. Mayor Cook? Yes. Councilman Grimm? Yes. Councilman Bond? Yes. Councilman Chambers? Yes.